Hi, I'm Monica Santos, and I teach anthropology in UP Diliman. In this video, I will be talking about the significance of practicing reflexivity in the context of service learning. As a student and researcher in anthropology, specifically linguistic and social anthropology, my work is geared towards understanding human difference, or what is commonly known as cultural difference. As part of our training in anthropology, we study social theory, read ethnographies, both of which involve examining the methodological process, including the challenges that ethnographers encounter in the field. The reason we do this is because ethnography requires intimacy with the people who are part of a research. What I mean here is that ethnography requires us to be in the same space, whether physical or virtual, as our research participants. And we often engage them in deep conversations about what is important in their lives. In other words, we really try to get to know them as deeply as we can. I mention this because doing service learning also requires or perhaps involves the same. Students who go through NSTP, whether it's under the ROTC, LTS, or CWTS programs, will probably end up having to learn about the community they will be working with, even if this happens beyond their time in the university. But even after going through rigorous pre-fieldwork training, including learning about the importance and problems of relativism, prioritizing the emic or insider's point of view in our ethnographic writing, and exposing ourselves to the variety of human practices and expressive forms, we still experience missteps in the field. In my case, I cannot forget the experience I had in the community where I was doing research and I had to fetch water from a water pump, which was quite a distance from where I was living. I could only carry a small pail, and when I got to the house, so much water has already spilled. So some of the kids from the community offered to help me for a minimum fee, which of course I gladly paid. However, in the weeks that followed, the minimal fee would increase, albeit very incrementally, but still very affordable. Of course, what I didn't realize was that everyone else in the community was experiencing the same increase in fees. I was only made aware of how my complicity in the increased rates affected the community when our neighbor joked, ito kasi si Monica, bayad lang ng bayad. This really made me think, because all the while, I thought I was helping the children so they can have a bit of extra baon, not realizing that what I thought were minimal and affordable increments was not the same for the community. That was a hard lesson for me, but something I never forgot. At the heart of this story is my lack of reflexivity or awareness of my own positionality, at least in those moments when I agreed to just keep on paying the increased fees. Even after all my training and even my own understanding and awareness that the community where I was doing research was an underserved community, and so much different from my own, there was still so much to learn about the why and how I was different from them. So this is what I want to discuss today, how we can apply reflexivity to the practice of service learning. But before I get into that, I will start with a brief discussion of an important concept that we use in anthropology, culture, and how this applies to our understanding of the Philippine nation. Etienne Balibar defines nation as an institution that more or less effectively united by sentiments, collective memories, political ideologies and structures, the administration, economic interests, and other elements that have their own historicity. In this definition, the nation is seen as an active project that remains in a constant state of reiteration through our social institutions, law, and individual actions. National projects are seen as benefiting everyone belonging to a state or a citizenry. And national symbols are created to represent a sense of collective identity for this citizenry. With this view of the nation, there seems to be an obvious connection to the concept of culture, especially when we see this in our constitution. In Article 2, Section 17, it states, the state shall give priority to education, science and technology, arts, culture, and sports to foster patriotism and nationalism, accelerate social progress, and promote total human liberation and development. 
Here, we see culture used as an instrument towards the project of nationalism. But what is culture? Common understandings of this term, including its deployment in our own constitution, focus on what Laster calls artifacts of society, as if culture and what constitutes it is a thing or a set of things that we can identify and list down and check if these are things that we practice and believe in. This way of looking at culture is essentializing as it assumes a bounded and a homogeneous identity for a group of people and highly normative, often promoting discussions about what we should do and what we should be. Some examples of these conversations are those that revolve around the idea of the Philippines or Filipinos as having a damaged culture, which was revived in the aftermath of the 2022 elections, along with the idea that Filipinos' natural inclination to be subservient and traditional were to be blamed for the bad choices that they made with their political leaders. But who are the Filipinos that they're speaking about? surely not the 110 million strong currently residing in the country. Even the elections showed us that not everyone voted in the same way. And whose standards are being used to assess the level of damage any given culture has incurred? These ideas about culture and more specifically um, of Philippine or Filipino culture are not about the people, but about stereotypes and frustrations that cannot be attributed to anybody. It demonstrates a lack of knowledge about the way the individual person makes decisions, the people and social institutions in their life that may or may not hold sway in their decisions, and the options that they have access to in their everyday lives. None of this information, which characterizes our life as individual human beings, is factored in in those careless statements about Filipino culture. And when called out, sometimes they will say, Okay, well, maybe not everyone. And this acknowledgement of difference, while often peripheral to their sentiments, is actually very important. As I mentioned earlier, our work in anthropology involves the understanding of difference. But instead of relying on stereotypes as the basis of these differences, anthropologists focus on meaning, how things can mean differently for different people and to what extent they share this with other members of their community. More importantly, we study how these meanings are formed, circulated, and naturalized, becoming part of each person's tacit and taken for granted knowledge about the world. As persons who will be engaging with communities different from our own, with persons who have different backgrounds from our own, it's important to base our understanding of difference, not on stereotypes, but on the idea that one, what we find meaningful in our life may not be meaningful to others. Second, that while we might find some commonalities with others, we cannot assume that we understand these commonalities in the same way. For instance, we may find that we share the same affinity for certain kinds of food, but not realize that the reason we like that food may be different from theirs. The same goes for the food that we avoid. Maybe we avoid certain foods because of our health or our personal preference, but others may avoid it for religious reasons. The bottom line here is that we must remember that the knowledge that constitutes the basis for our own desires, choices, beliefs, and practices is not universal, nor is it superior to other forms of knowledge. So as we do our work with communities as part of service learning, whether you're doing ROTC, LTS or CWTS, perhaps we should always keep in mind what these two words might mean. Service. Maybe we should reflect on who we are serving and why. Whose interests are being served in the kind of assistance that we will provide to the communities? Towards what ends? And how can our presence in their lives be meaningful to them in positive ways? Here, we can look into their own notions of well-being and security and pay attention to local knowledge and local processes. Which leads to the second word, learning. We're also there to learn from the community, to learn about their lives and what is meaningful to them. More importantly, we also need to learn about the structural inequalities that necessitate our service in their community. 
In this way, we learn to appreciate and respect our differences, but also understand how some of these are born out of differential access to the rights and privileges we are supposed to be equally experiencing as citizens of the country. The practice of reflexivity is at the heart of these discussions. To be reflexive is to be self-aware of your biases, your beliefs, your understanding of how things work and how they should work, your sense of taste or aesthetics, your social positionalities. After all, you are a person too. Engaging with the community is a two-way street, meaning as you learn about the community, they're also trying to figure you out. So you must always be aware that your words, actions, and identities matter, as these will be the basis by which the community will respond to you. Reflexivity requires us to be more thoughtful about thinking and speaking for others. It requires us to constantly assess and reassess how our actions and ideas may be affecting others. As I discussed in the beginning of this video, engaging with the community is and should be an intimate experience since it involves a process of getting to know one another. And so for your exercise, I would like you to do your own personal anthropology. I borrow this concept from David Pocock and Drid Williams. This involves some introspection on your own encounters and experiences with difference. For this exercise, I want you to recall an event or a moment in your life when you experienced culture shock, or maybe you were exposed to something that you were not familiar with. And then think back to your own reactions to this experience and reflect on what might have informed your responses. I will give you an example. When I was studying in the US, I was shocked to learn how some graduate students would actually buy a house near the campus. When I asked them why, they said, well, I'll be here for the next eight years, might as well just buy a house instead of renting. I was going to be there for the same amount of time, but I never even thought or considered that option. And I wondered why. Perhaps because I equated house with home. And to me, home is something more permanent, like an ancestral home. I was also an international student, not a citizen. And the thought of having to deal with the paperwork needed to make that happen was just not part of what I felt I could do. As such, my social positionality as someone with a stable home life in the Philippines and just having a temporary stay in the US as a non-citizen perhaps informed my response to house buying in the US. You can do this exercise synchronously and share your experiences in class and let your classmates share their impressions on your experiences. Or you can do it asynchronously in the discussion forum where you can share a discussion post and have your classmates reply to your post. The objective of this exercise is to develop your sense of self-awareness. As you start conceptualizing your projects, it would be good to have a pause and reflect on the basis of your projects. Are these coming from your own knowledge of what the community needs? or how you think they should do things. In this case, perhaps it's good to reframe your projects based on what the community members are telling you and find common ground with them on a project that they will find useful that will fit within your own timelines and the resources you have access to. Part of our service to the nation is recognizing and understanding the diversity of experiences of Filipinos and helping others requires that we reflect on where we're coming from first. So as you develop your projects for CWTS or LTS, or as you undergo your ROTC training, always try to remember that serving others is not about you. It's about helping people to make their lives better, whether this will be in the form of material assistance, enriching their knowledge, or offering them protection to make them feel safer or more secure. I hope that this video will help you realize your own social positionalities and how you can use this knowledge to be better interlocutors and partners in your communities as part of service learning in NSTP. Thank you for listening.